check. The answer is not here. No. Uh, there is some issue with his brother actually. Okay. okay. Mm. So, uh, so can we begin? It's All eleven o'clock, okay. so that we. I'm, I'm happy. Yes. Yes. Happy. Okay. Yes, the more time we get to spend with you, the better for us. Yes. Yes. Uh, we are into the new edition of our Writers Beyond Distance. And it is such a great pleasure for us and an, an honor also for the college that the legend of Indian English poetry, KK and Daruwala sir, is with us. And we wish to listen to him as much as possible. We want to talk to him as much as possible. So without a lot of formalities, I, on behalf of my college, on behalf of my department, all my colleagues, extend a very heartfelt and deepest welcome to our guest speaker today, to KKN Daruwala sir. We also welcome the participants joining us today from different colleges, the faculty members of different colleges, as well as the students from our college and different colleges. I hope and I wish that, that, that as time passes, this talk is going to be a very enriching and once in a lifetime kind of experience for us. So with no formality actually, I request our colleague Bashudhara Roy to introduce the topic to, to enrich our young participants about Kiki and Daru Alasar and to initiate the discussion. Dr. Bashudhara Roy. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, I will just, uh, uh, you know, uh, share the contents of my screen with you so that uh, it will be visible to people. Uh, just a second. So is it visible? Is my screen visible? Yes, yes, by Yes. So uh, I have to minimize it so that uh, you know other people uh, we can have other people join. Okay. So uh now uh, KK and Daruwala sir is someone who needs no introduction to uh, any gathering, let alone an academic one. Uh, but however, for many of uh, our young students here who are encountering uh, his work for the first time uh, in their uh, various syllabi, you know. We will uh, talk about him. So KK Nasarwanji Daruwala is one of India's foremost poets and writers. He was born in Lahore in 1937. His father, N.C. Daruwala, being an eminent professor in the government college Lahore. His family left undivided India in 1945 and moved to Junagar uh, and then to Rampur in India. As a result, he grew up studying in various schools and in various languages. He obtained his master's degree in English literature from Government College Ludhiana, University of Punjab, and spent a year at Oxford as Queen Elizabeth House Fellow in 1980-81. He joined the Indian Police Service in 1958 and retired as Chairman, Joint Intelligence Committee in 1995. He was also a Special Assistant to the Prime Minister on International Affairs in 1970-71 and was subsequently in the Cabinet Secretariat until his retirement. 
His first book of poetry was Under Orion, which was published by Writers Workshop India in 1970, exactly 50 years ago. We celebrate the 50th anniversary of his first book of poetry this year. He then went on to publish a second collection, Apparition, in April in 1971, for which he was given the Uttar Pradesh State Award in 1972. He won the Sahitya Academy Award given by India's National Academy of Letters in 1984. However, he returned it in October 2015 in a protest with the statement that the organization Sahitya Academy has failed to speak out against ideological collectives that have used physical violence against authors. Daruwala sir did not take back his award even after Sahitya Academy passed a resolution condemning the attacks on rational thinkers saying, what you do, you do once. For his first, for his second poetry collection, Landscape, no, third poetry collection, Landscape, he was awarded the Commonwealth Poetry Award Asia, 1987. His first novel, For Pepper and Christ, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Fiction Prize in 2010. He was awarded the Padma Shri in 2014. Most recently, he was honored with the Poet Laureate Award at the Tata Literature Life Festival 2017. His work has been translated into Spanish, Swedish, Magyar, German, and Russian. He will be reading at the Glass House Literary Festival this month. Now, we have here a few reviews of uh, KT Sir's novels, uh, his uh, first novel for Pepper and Christ, uh, which uh, you know has won wonderful reviews. And I will just, you know, stretch my screen here so that uh, participants can read it. Here is Anita Mason in the Warwick Review commenting on For Pepper and Christ. It is rich, generous, and poetic. The bustling of soup and street, of the red seaports and the wharves of Sidon is conjured so vividly one can smell the incense and taste the salt. Elsewhere, it opens out. The sea swells and glitters. Maps are talked of rhapsodically. And there is a tremendous sense of history blowing on its unstoppable way. Daruwala moves surely from the grand prospect to the detail, from brutality to tenderness. And the book, as it becomes darker, is still shot through with dazzling color. Here we have K. Natwar Singh commenting on For Pepper and Christ. The care of the time reminds us of one of the novels of Nobel laureate Nagib Mahfuz. Daruwala's research is formidable. Each character rings true and captures the modes of the 15th century splendidly. Uh, we have uh, uh, an excerpt from uh, Neelam Saran Gore's article in Indian literature where she comments on swerving to solitude. So we have gems like silence drops like a metal paperweight on a library floor. And I liked the sound of Spanish, a sibilance slipping into another, almost surreptitiously, like a lover's arm around your waist. And again, stealing to this welter of imagery and commentary is a story branching back into several stories over several generations, spanning several cities, continents, and epochs. So here we have the great, the brilliant Keki and Daruwala himself. And I would no longer like to be a hindrance between him and uh, you, know, you all. Uh, so I request Keki sir to kindly uh, you know, uh, talk about uh, his life, uh, his work, uh, which will be followed up by uh, questions from our participants. Over to you, Keki sir. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you, Professor Yahya Ibrahim and uh, Basudhara Roy, uh, for uh, the cyber friend who has managed to <laughs> get me here. Uh, well, I'll, uh, it's a it's a privilege to talk about your own in your, your own work, but uh, my first book under Orion has already put in fifty years. Uh, it has had three different editions as well. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, one really feels old that one's first book is now 50 years old. Uh, for the last three years, after my uh, last uh, book, uh, a poetry book, I was devoted more to fiction and to the novel. 
but then chance uh, i mean life is a, a happenstance of various things that happen to you i went to cyprus for a conference and i was asked by the audience to write poems on cyprus so when i came back in fact uh, right in cyprus uh, i had gone for uh, stefano's stefanides uh, farewell a uh, very fine uh, big poet of the aegean and i started writing a few poems then i resurrected my poems from on alaska i had been there for a on a 15 day trip and then came the knockdown and the lockdown i uh, the very similar sounding words and i wrote poems and then when the lockdown came i went into i went into our friend the great dante uh, i have two or three uh, translations of the inferno got involved in the inferno then i was asked to write uh, uh, write something on uh, for an anthology and i wrote a clutch of sonnets rhymed i uh, don't have unrhymed sonnets as people these days seem to have and wrote uh, on the black death a clutch of sonnets on the black death and uh, involved with dante at at the moment uh, it was an opportunity otherwise you never read the inferno or you read the, you i have a ulysses also behind me so Uh, if this goes on and on i may even read the ulysses <laughs> uh i have talked about a few strands of my writing i mean if you write for 50 years you have you can't write on the same theme so i'll uh, may i read a few poems on each of them and the first is myth history and i am reading from my uh, which i treasure the most uh, fire altar which i wrote uh, poems on the persians and the greeks and i'll uh, there are nine sonnets on cyrus i don't i won't bother you with all but i went to pasargade and uh, i talk of silence and proceed i'll just read two or three sonnets out of them number 1 the ground is not crisscrossed by water channels now there is no thicket of saplings around the tomb there is a huge tomb of cyrus you can uh, one day easily google and they were even thinking of a hydroelectric project there but the whole world protested uh and the uh, the project was dropped uh, i believe alexander went there and wept when he saw the tomb uh, he talked about greatness uh, what happens to greatness after all it's the tomb the ground is not crisscrossed by water channels now there is no thicket of saplings around the tomb though across the road a thin stemmed poplar grove flames in autumnal fires there is no mosque dome no bazaar no kasba just one vast plain and a sleep on the skyline python coils that sprawl the low detritus of the zagros range it is difficult to conjure up an entrance hall from the bull's severed legs which you cannot find or two or let two peers dictate a profound perspective a colonnade etched only in the mind to make a skeleton out of some bone splinter an imperial precinct out of fluting columns and ice age 
out of one solitary winter. There were hardly any landmarks, uh, just a few little, uh, unlike Persepolis, where it has. I'll read, read two more because I'm talking of silence. Second sonnet, belief is not easy here, never is. One hears the palace was a well-lit oblong, exquisitely proportioned, white limestone capitals rose from black plinths like a song. Walls finished in stucco you can conjure up, but not their paint in lapis lazuli blue or turquoise green. Their fade outs disorients. History fades when the signposts are so few. Before I think of paint, I must think of walls, time crumbling, history fraying into mythos, while no mirror, no echo answers from the halls. Emptiness, space, I face a wall at last. I'm no alchemist to make the great crossing from the dross of the present to the gold dust past. And the last sonnet I'll read. The last one is actually dramatic where Cyrus says, here I lie, Cyrus, king of the Persians, stranger, don't grudge me these few feet of space. But I'm not reading that. I'm reading the eighth. Dawn means glory. It's the wrong time to come, to rummage in the ruins, most of them lost. The wrong time, perhaps, but the right season with the darkening solstice and the night's first frost. Slurring over the plain, uh, sorry, it should have read, the wrong time, perhaps, but the right season with the darkening solstice and the night's first frost slurring over the plain. It was dark, they said. The pine torches flickered when your body was brought, I'm addressing Cyrus, from the Araxes River or the lands of the Scythians or wherever you fought. By wick and tallow flame, they brought you then and placed you in a gold sarcophagus after passing through a stone door seven feet by ten. Tense, windless silence as yet unfailing. Women and disturbance kept at bay a mile away, a female's skyline's distant wailing. Uh, you know, you don't say women are wailing, women are crying. You, you, uh, you're writing poetry. You write a mile away, a female skyline's distant wailing. That's how you, that's how you go about it. Uh, come to the personal. After all, you have to come to the personal and I... Uh, right, uh, I'm reading a short poem. I hope that poem of mine didn't uh, uh, go overhead because you were not seeing the landscape as I was. I'd been to Iran and at Pasag Pasargade, and that is what uh, uh, inspired me. Landscape comes comes alive through your poems. It comes alive for us. Uh, this is to my daughter Ruben, uh, on her birth. Three years and then again the uterus flowered. She is the, my second daughter. Lights reeled for her and then blacked off as they drew you from the weed bed of the womb. Then you cried a lung of light in a dark room and she came back, which means my wife came back. Two vaccine marks sprout bulbous on your arm, which lies over my shoulder halfway across my back. 
and as you turn warmer and heavier in my arms i know that sleep has caught up with you a uh, sleeping child weighs more supple boned fledgling you are all bristle soft chalk bone and spiny shadow your looks quick with startled birds snug in a forest of syllables without which the winds prowl without which the winds howl but cannot enter may you live forever in the house of words but if you falter blind with rain don't panic you will find an arm brown as bark and when you reach for the bark uh, may you find the flowers thereon while wandering you may hitchhike through the strangest lands but when you rest have known things around you look fresh like a rain washed leaf with a spray of light on it and may your breath be spiked as now with the tang of mint and clove and cinnamon uh, uh, there are some poems on love but i can i can leave them for the time being elegy yes elegy was a fad was a fad with poets who were writing I, in my first book there are i think two or three uh, elegies and the first one was black rain and black rain i sent to that great uh, he became the president of senegal i forget his name just now it uh, names slip out and he must have put that in uh, um, i saw a magazine called the black orpheus and there uh, my poem must have figured and wole shoenka picked the poem up for uh, poems from black africa I, he must have thought i was from africa and i got a poem but there were three misprints firstly they spelled my name wrongly and there were two other misprints in the poem so, uh, black rain i'll i'll read one minute uh, my blank from six it's good to mark the pages and uh, it was an elegy without anything uh, anything dying elegy 3 so i must have written two more in my first book under orion i cannot cry like you shoulders hunched into a knot of pain and the face breaking into a thousand pieces i must stand erect my eyes spaceless and open too much blinking against the cold wind and they may think i am holding back tears you know is the mail pride coming through i must live with my grief as a stone breaker lives with his vocation must feed them on the 13th day on plantain leaves go to office with a shaved head hang my coat on a peg and pretend that nothing has happened the roles are reversed in a way not exactly for that would look stage managed but others are crying around you today as live ash sizzles on the cold river like a dying passion it takes all the strength in me to restrain a shiver and yet with all the cold despair around this sterile moment oozing thin black rain i envy you the quiver with which your tears came and your relief as for me gray hair roots sprouting from the scalp next week may be my only catharsis 
and I'll read from bypass, which are the first, uh, the first six sonnets. I'll just read the first two, if you don't mind. Now I look for a bypass everywhere. Bypass is not the hard bypass, is the bypass we talk about the roads uh, going here and there. Now I look for a bypass everywhere. The black serpent, well tarred, leaving town. After a mere show of circumambulation, sliding along the curve and yet not fully round. Leaving the city shuttered with dogma, its pretenses wafer crisp, slowly peeling, leaving those wise councils behind. Gather yourself, get a hold over your feelings. Look eastwards when you pray. What makes them think I do? And such injunctions from adherents of the text. I can't think of directions. I can only think of you. There are others, well-meaning, less circumspect, who say, give rein to your feelings. I smile. I unfurl my passions were there any left to this is the last I'll read. Hence, cautiously in the middle lane between demonology and miracle, both whizzing past, I'll read that again because they are significant lines. Hence, cautiously in the middle lane between demonology and miracle, both whizzing past, I drive yet unsure if I have broken away and am moving into loneliness at last. When you can't face up to dust and people and memory that stalks you, this could mean flight. Greater people have moved into ashrams, cults and things. So why should I be denied? A change, of course. And this sudden hold on the suddenness of grief if the lease on faith is over, why the remorse? And yet, this always happens for a brief moment. The rear view mirror confounds. Are you moving into or out of unbelief? Uh, animal and bird life, I'll read a poem called Wolf, may I? And Oh, I shouldn't forget love, huh? remind me. I have lots of poems on Mazars and uh, Mohram uh, because I lived in Lucknow for four years. Oh, one, one second. 196. Okay, 196. I was surprised the other day, uh, a year, uh, year back. Uh, uh, Indian poet from Canada and after his reading, this was in the Connaught place at a lovely restaurant and I went up and shook hands and I said, I am so and so and he said, oh, I, we teach your poem, The Wolf, uh, in a class. So here goes Wolf. Fire lit Half silhouette and half myth, the wolf circles my past, treading the leaves into a bed till he sleeps, black snout on extended paws. Black snout on sulfur body, he nudged his way into my consciousness. Prowler, wind sniffer, throat catcher, his cries drew a ring around my night. A child's night is a village on the forest edge. My mother said his ears stand up at the fall of dew. He can sense a shadow move across the hedge on a dark night. He can sniff out your approaching dreams. There is nothing that won't be lit up by the dark torch of his eyes. The wolves have been slaughtered now. 
this is the last stanza, three lines. The wolves have been slaughtered now. A hedge of smoking gun barrels rings my daughter's dreams. You know, you are talking of generations. My generation was reared up with uh, poems on wolves, etc. Now, uh, when I was in service and I moved in the hills, I was seven years in the hills, and I could hear jackals. And now you can hear nothing. So all that you have is smoking gun barrels around animal life. Uh, I'm reaching almost to the end. This is exploring terra firma. I wrote a whole book on uh, the map maker. The map maker was an exploratory sort of book, and uh, the what I consider my best was when my editor said that's a that's a bad poem. He didn't want it. And uh, I, it was uh, accepted in America. But then I decided, I said, if I have to, uh, and the other three sonnets I wrote, I think I'll rewrite only, I'll read only one. Forget markings. This is the third sonnet. Forget markings. Forget landfall and sea. Get easy, go easy, man. I tell myself, breathe. Gulls will mark the estuary for you. Bubbles will indicate where the swamps seed. Map the wrinkles on the aging skin of love. Forget Eastings, Northings. They stand for order. Cry if you must over that locust line flayed open into a barbarized border. I was thinking of the Indo-Pakistan border. Mark a poem that hasn't broken forth. Map the undefined, the swamp within, the hedge between love and hate. Forget the coastal Casuarina line. Reefs one must handle. It's lust that seeks out its quarry that one cannot map, nor that heaving salt of desire that floods the creek. I don't know. I'll, I'll read the fourth, may I? If you map the future, you know, you. I started with a small map, the little map shelter, and the poem moves then to uh, between love and hate and now uh, uh, across time. If you map the future while a millennium moves on its hinges, I wrote this near the 20,000, you know. If you map the future while a millennium moves its hinges, you may find the present turned to an anachronism. This too is important, what is yours and mine. The silk of these shared moments but having stuck to love and poetry, herding the voice of reason and experiencing the different textures of a season of love and love's eternal season, I put a clamp on yearning, shun latitudes, renounce form and turn my eye to the far kingdom of bloodless Kalinga battling with the storm. It was that big, huge storm in Orissa 20, 22 years ago. Dampen your fires, turn from lighthouse, spire, steeple. Forget maps and voyaging. Study instead the past earth horoscope of a brown people. 
I'll read that again. Forget maps and voyaging. Study instead the past earth horoscope of a brown people. Uh, that's what we must go into and not the rest. Uh, yes, a very, very short poem called Night Fishing. A mood poem. You must know what a, uh, at least your students, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not talking to the staff. They, are, they know more of literature than I do. But I'm talking to the students. I hope there are some students here. So it's a mood poem. Uh, many students, many students. I have done. Many students are here. I've done fishing only once in my life. Caught one fish and the second was small. It was a small trout. So we, I put it back in the, in the river. It was in Srinagar uh, above uh, where now you have a lot of Ta ta ta. Night fishing. A shore lamp, a shore lamp drops its lighted tackle on the hook. No fish snout spin. Night fishing, sad as night rain, alone as the mind before the dreams crowd in. And uh, what is it? Political, yes, to a Palestinian poet. I, uh, the inspiration was in Damascus. I led, a, what is it called, a cultural or whatever you call it, delegation to uh, Syria. And uh, Sachi was a part of it, Sachitanandan. And uh, Mrs. Sharma, she was there. She is a, a professor in Persian. And I wrote this poem. It's very political. And the last, I forgot to read my love poem. Let's forget it. If you, you want me to read it later, I, I will. Uh, I, I want to tell you that uh, a poem has I it comes naturally to me, possibly because of my reading. It has to be woven around images. You don't say uh, people are the, as I said, you, women are crying. No, a uh, night skies, um, uh, a skyline of uh, women wailing, you know, or, or female wailing. So it's always the the image you start with. And this poem I also read in Struga, uh, where Mahmud Darwish was given the wreath, uh, the golden wreath in Struga in Macedonia. They, I have been there twice when the famous Greek poet got it once in 1970 or 71. And then uh, the, this uh, trip to Struga where Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian poet, got it. And it is almost addressed to him. And when I read it, the Iranian poet, uh, husband and wife, they were very, they were very good. And they, they told me some very fine anecdotes. One was, oh, uh, may I pass off into an anecdote? Uh, what they told me was, uh, after the revolution, Iranian revolution, uh, Man came back from uh, Indian came back from USA, and he said, "I want to let's go to a restaurant in the evening." So they said, "Let's go to the mosque." He said, "Mosque, mosque. Uh, I mean, you go there to pray." No, no, no. They said you. So he said, "What happens to the Malvis, the Muezzins, and the Khatibs?" They said, "Oh, they are all in the university." Oh, he said, "Really." Uh, I'm surprised. And he says, what happens to the professors and the students in the universities? They said they are all in jail. Oh, he said, oh, really? And uh, what has happened to the, the, the people in the jail? Uh, they said they are all in the, in the cabinet. Uh, and he says, what has happened to the criminals? 
No, so, sorry. He, they said, and what has happened to the criminals in the jail? And he said, they are all in the cabinet, in the majlis, as they call it in Iran. He told me a very good story, and I have never forgotten it. Uh, to a Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Darwish, but I have not written Mahmoud Darwish. And when he died, I wrote, uh, well, in my, I can't say it was a fine uh, ode, but I have written a decent ode to Mahmoud Darwish. The Palestinian, to a Palestinian poet, we were 15 days in Damascus. You claim your vineyard has been robbed. If the vineyard is robbed, then the wine is theirs. If the wine is theirs, so is the intoxication, the, the humar as we call it. But when, but then what are you left with without vineyard, wine and intoxication? You were born east of Acre in Galilee. You were a kid in 1948. In your innocence, you are still a child railing against your destiny, against the pitiless heavens. In Urdu, the sky or falak is always pitiless. I don't know how it goes in your language. Your destiny had a travel pass which took you to unknown lands, unknown in the sense that you looked for your home there and didn't find it. The years had nothing much to teach you. For you, for you knew already that it's not just the desert that can destroy your vineyards. History also can. Your chant was exile, your blood was exile, your bread was exile. I can see you, I can see your blood curdle and turn thick as Turkish coffee when you think of exile. As a fellow poet, I condone your excesses. And now I'm quoting him. Measuring the sky with chains, unquote. A blood drop looking for a wound, unquote. That, those are two lines from him. Let's have less of blood, both in poetry and on the ground. Let peace descend on you and your neighboring people. They too have had 2,000 years old exile. I pray that they never drive your children into the desert and may your children never drive them into the sea. Thank you. I am through. Any questions? You want me to read further? Beautiful. But first I'd like to have Beautiful. comments uh, and conversation. Yes, yes. Uh, you can have a glass of water if you please. You have been reading for quite a while. Have a sip of water. Uh, well, I don't have one nearby, so just forget it. <laughs> I should have been careful. Fine. Okay. No, you can you can go and get a sip. We'll wait for you. No, no. We'll wait for you. That's all right. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, we have all been you know, mesmerized by uh, the session and uh, by your reading, by your wonderful poems. We have many uh, faculty members and many students with us here today who uh, would be very, very interested uh, to talk to you, to learn something from you. So we are open to questions. Uh, Keki Sir is open to questions. Uh, it would be better if uh, people could type their questions in the chat box I'll, so that I'll we could invite you. Uh, yes. So that we could invite you uh, one by one to ask your questions. Uh, or you could just even type your names uh, in the chat box. So all students, all guests who are desirous of asking questions, please type uh, your names 
and uh, sorry, please type your questions in the chat box so that we know who wants to ask and we can, uh, you know, invite them to put forward their question. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, no, we were, we were, uh, we were talking to our guests. We were asking them to type their questions in the chat box so that we could invite them uh, to ask yeah. questions. Manoj Kumar. So here we have uh, Professor uh, Manoj. Manoj. It's Manoj, you can unmute yourself and you can uh, you can unmute your audio and video and you can uh, you, you know uh, talk to sir personally and ask your question. He wants to know something about the art of writing poems. Uh, art of writing poetry. Yes. That's too big a question, sir. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you. I mean. First thing, you have to be really interested in poetry. I mean, I, I was, I, I won't mention the college, one of the top colleges in Delhi. And uh, I talked about memorizing poetry and the head of the department uh, brushed it off saying, that was in your time. Now we can go to Google and uh, get a poem immediately. Now, that is, that, is a, that is the wrong outlook on poetry. I, I can, I can uh, recite at least for one hour, at least for one hour. The, in Cyprus, I went with Stefanos to a very fine lady who held a bookshop for 40 years. And I picked up a book and I gave it to him. And I said, now open and I'll read out. And he held the book and I just kept on talking about it, the poetry of Macaulay. So you must first love reading poetry and also memorizing it. You must get into the rhythm. The, the people who are writing poetry today are not into the, the classic mode at all into a sonnet to a villanelle or a you know uh, or an elegy the, the the way it is structured and of course modern poetry is modern poetry uh, in america if you rhyme uh, you are looked down upon so uh, times change uh, fashions change everything changes hi maya joshi i can uh, almost wave to her uh, so, uh, what I'm trying to say is, and you write around images, you don't write uh, the way you write a prose passage. So, as long as it is distinct from prose and has some inner feeling uh, and you talk about an incident or event, an emotional event, in a way that you wouldn't have done in prose, uh, well, that comes, that becomes verse or poetry. That's all I can say. I mean, but it's a too large a question to the art of poetry. Yes, any other? There must. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, thank you, Manoj. Is also satisfied with what you told him. Uh, do we have more questions? Uh, Basu, may I ask? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Certainly. Uh, sir, it's not a question. It is more an observation. Because somewhere I read that uh, you are a strong believer of poetry deriving its inner strength from social awareness. And you are an ardent supporter that poetry must have and should have a sense of commitment. So this is one approach of yours in poetry. The other is that you are famous for your landscape paintings through words. And you have never denied it also. I mean, I mean the landscape that we find in your poetry. So uh, don't, don't you think that these two things are 
a bit contradictory or dichotomic or if not how you balance these two things so what you are trying to say is social commentary or political commentary uh, can't be balanced with your love for landscape am i am i right is that the question uh, that, that, uh, that is well there are there have to be many aspects of of a if i may use the word personality all of us have uh, numerous shades in our personality and in 50 years of writing uh, that's why i told you uh, i'm reading the different strands i didn't read about landscape i have the when i was criticized for writing on landscapes i said i must serve these wretched critics right and i wrote a book called landscapes that's that's the way to that's the way to do it and i did it uh, the, the first uh, the first book uh, the first poem was mandwa and we went to mandwa my brother took me there he belonged to a sailing club there and from bombay we went there and there was a storm three days storm and i wrote this and um, many years back someone told me that my poem is still hung in that particular club where we stayed the sailing club so landscape uh, also is was a revelation to me i had lived in small towns gone to college gone to school never really roamed around villages or anything you know and when in the police i started doing that and you saw the uh, the, the uh, flower you know the mustard flowering uh, in uh, in winter and the rice coming up and uh, it was a it was not a revelation but it had a terrific impact on me and uh, I, I i wrote on landscapes and when i'm writing on landscapes i'm writing on mother earth i'm writing on uh, what we are living in and what has nourished us all over and politics you can't if you are an indian you can't uh, uh, ex extract yourself away from politics and these days i'm writing i'm not reading anything because in the last zoom i had with dr malashri lal i read three or four poems of that but i hope to come out with a book called the political poems political poems just just this and uh, they'll start with oh jerusalem uh, it's a, uh, i don't have it here uh, it will be a it will be a poem on what uh, israel did in gaza unfortunately and already my uh, publisher has told me no no i'll uh, not publish a book with that kind of a statue so let's see <laughs> yeah yes so uh, it's not mine uh, uh, not sorry we have a, a question from yes yes sir you were saying something we have a question from Suprabhat Chatterjee. Uh, Suprabhat Chatterjee uh, has typed his question in the chat box. He says that Sir Sri Aurobindo talks of poetry as a rhythmic voyage. Aurobindo talks of poetry as a rhythmic voyage. Uh, so, is your depiction of landscape a poetry through which to discover the inner human and the social? Uh, you know, I don't understand the question it started with Aurobindo and then it went on to ah, he says that to you he says that Sri Aurobindo talks of poetry as a voyage of discovery so yeah. is your landscape poetry also an attempt to discover something within the human inner self no no I when I write about landscapes I just write about landscapes the reed the marsh the snipe the birds uh, I'm writing about. I mean, if you read the 
introduction to this book, uh, my last poetry book. Uh, Arundhati Subramaniam has been gracious enough to write. Uh, and she talks about uh, uh, the birds. How do I write about the birds? I have written about uh, the hawk, the falcon, the, the barbet. Uh, so uh, it's uh, observation of, uh, I would call it nature poetry. I would call my landscape poetry nature poetry. And I didn't get what uh, Sri Aurobindo talked about landscapes. Sorry, I, the, I missed the words. I'm a little bad at hearing. No problem. Uh, no problem. Yes. Uh, Dibya Kundu has a question. Uh, who are your inspirations in poetry? Which particular Sorry? poets uh, inspired you? It was Dibya Kundu wants to know who were your inspirations in poetry? Who inspired you to write poetry? Who are the poets who continue to read? Oh, that's, that's very simple. Uh, my father being a professor, and he was very good at elocution. I mean, uh, I, I still can, I'm, well, I'm uh, half as good as him, but I can come out with uh, a lot of speeches in Hamlet and Macbeth and, uh, and all the rest. So he would read out Shakespeare to us and uh, lots of other things. I uh, went into Persian myth, Rustam and Sorab and all the rest due to him. I think we are coming to an end. The Zoom is sounding uh, warnings, it seems. Uh, so uh, I read a lot of uh, poetry uh, and when I was a child or a boy, uh, adolescence. And uh, that took me to poetry. But even then, I said, I want to write stories. And I, I got two stories published when I was 12 or 13. Then a horrible magazine called Common Wheel, uh, totally, uh, totally uh, uh, right wing, totally right wing. Yes, go ahead. Are we mute now? Yes, yes. Sorry. Yes, I had muted myself. Uh, there is a question from one of our students here, uh, yes. Srishti Kumari, and she wants to ask, uh, she wants to ask whether, you know, a poem should, should a poem always have something extraordinary to say? Can a poem be on simple things? Should it always have something extraordinary to say? And uh, for example, a poem like a haiku, uh, how does it make uh, you know sense, uh, though it is very small? You are talking about haiku, are you? Uh, she's trying to ask whether a poem should always have something extraordinary to say. I so I'm sorry, I... I, I no, no, no problem. I will, I will repeat uh, the question. It is also a little convoluted. The question itself is convoluted. Anyways, uh, she's trying to ask, should a poem always some, have something extraordinary in between the lines? Uh, that is, I think, the first part of her question. Should a poem have something extraordinary to say? Can it be uh, based on ordinary experience as well? Is it uh, is the name of the poet mentioned or something? No. No, any poem, any poem. Does poetry say something extraordinary, or can it, uh, you know, talk about ordinary things also? I, you 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 can't say something extraordinary in poem after poem. You have to. I mean, poetry or art uh, comes from life. I'm reading Dante where he says that all art comes after nature, you know. So, uh, in one book, there will be three or four tremendous poems. And the other will be of what is, what is actually happening around the man or the woman who is writing, or the child that is writing. 
So that is why I brought the other things, animal life, love, energy, death. These are the things you write about. So you do have to write about something extraordinary all the time. Otherwise, you will only write about an earthquake or a flood. <laughs> Yes. Uh, do we have more questions from the audience? Uh, uh, sir. So, yes, Esther. Yes. Uh, uh, sir. Brian wants to say something. Uh, sir, I'm not yes. asking any question. I, I just wanted to give you a small information that recently we were reviewing the post graduation syllabus of our university and we have enriched it with two of your poems. One is titled Migrations, and the other is titled The Epileptic. Which so is the other? Which is migrations the other? And, migrations and Epileptic. These two are the poems with which we have enriched our PG syllabus here of Kulhan University. Migrations? So I, and, yes. Yeah, I, I just think. wanted to listen something from you regarding these two poems. <laughs> the migration has become a favorite. I mean, there was a, at the national... Uh, gallery of art. There was a huge exhibition and uh, I was asked to uh, start it and the, uh, my poem on migration was, you know, uh, Ranjit Hoskote and his wife, uh, 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 they, they were kind enough to, for, for the exhibition uh, to, to, to start with that poem. It's, it's because I've talked about my mother who was very disappointed that I had forgotten her mother. Uh, that was one. And is the other, the epileptic, which is the other poem? The yes, other the, poem epileptic. the epileptic. The epileptic. Epileptic. Do you want me to read one of them? Migration. May I read this? No, the I epileptic. just wanted to. I, I just wanted I, to listen yes, to you regarding these poems. I'll tell you. Uh, I was walking with my wife in Barabanki, where I wrote, because P. Lal asked me for a book. That's how I started writing uh, my first book. And uh, a couple was coming in a rickshaw, and the the lady got uh, a fit. And they, they put the things in the mouth so that they don't, she doesn't bite the tongue or something. And I saw that, and I, I wrote the poem. And this has been, uh, this has been anthologized in Canada and USA. And yes, when yes. I read in USA, I, I, uh, I didn't read the poem, but I said anything. If you are talking about hunger, so or you are talking about disease, then you will include it in your uh, poetry books. Uh, and nothing good about India will uh, come out. And there was uh, in your uh, selections and uh, they, uh, they, uh, there was a lot of embarrassed, very embarrassed laughter from the audience, from the audience. Uh, I, I'll just, I think I have the, I don't have the, has, I hope you'll get a book or two in the, in your library from, from us. Yes, sir. It is available, sir. We searched it. We 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 make we ensure that the text is available. Migration is three forty-four. One minute. Shall I? Shall I read migrations? Sure. May I? Sure, yes, sir. sir. Okay. Please, sir. Migrations are always difficult. Ask my, I'll tell you, my mother would keep telling me that you would run from the kitchen with a plate. I mean, she must have been making fries or something and saying galam galam. And I was, I must have been three or two and a half. And she said, you can't recognize, you can't remember my mother. I said, I'm sorry, I can't. Migrations are always difficult. Ask any drought. Any plague, ask the year 1947, ask the chronicles themselves, ask the chronicles themselves. If there had been no migration, 
would there have been enough history to munch on? Going back in time is also tough. And anyone backtracking to Sargodha or Jhelum or Miyawali, and they'll tell you new faces among bricks. I'm talking of people going back to their old houses and they are welcomed. This is your house. You know, this was your house, but it has been taken over now. New faces among old brick, politeness, sentiment, dripping from the lips of strangers. This is still your house, sir. Mother used to ask, don't you remember my mother? You'd be in the kitchen all the time and run with the fries she ladled out, still sizzling on the plate. Don't you remember her at all? Mother's fallen face would fall further at my impassivity. Now my dreams ask me if I remember my mother and I'm not sure how I'll handle that. My greeting across ears is also difficult. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you so much, sir. So good. Thank you. Thank you. We I'm have so a question from... Uh, this one has been taken. Yes, sir? I have three migration uh, women, so I hope this is the one which has been taken. Yes, I think this is the one that has been taken. Yeah, yes, sir? I think this yes, is the poem. Yes. 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 Cult poem. Basu. Basu. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you a question to sir? Yes, Thanks of course, much. of course, sir. Please, please. Sorry? And A.K. Das, uh, may yes. I ask a personal question, sir, if you don't mind? Yes, sir. Please go ahead, Dad, sir. Uh, you had served as an IPS officer for a pretty long time, uh, which is a world yes. of roughness and toughness, apparently. And at the same time, we have dabbled in poetry, fiction, <laughs> novels, which is a different world of softness, empathy, imagination. Do you find in your career, these two worlds, do you find in your long career, these two worlds conflicting with one another or did they prove to be complementary to one another? This is my humble question, sir. I, firstly, I want to clarify that I remained in police for 16 years in 1974 way resigned and I joined the cabinet secretariat in Delhi. So, and even from those 16 years, five years were in the hills, as in the SSB, when we were training to the villagers to fight the Chinese if they ever came across. So, from 1963 to 1968, I was in the UP hills and did a lot of trekking also, went up to the Barahoti Pass, etc., across the Cherhoti. And uh, I come from a literary family. My brothers were very good with Shakespeare, and I'm the youngest now. I'm the only one left. And uh, my father was a professor of English. So that is what brought me into, into literature and art. He would talk to us about Botticelli, about Raphael, about Leonardo da Vinci, and we had those books with us. So uh, reading made a lot of difference in my sensibility. Uh, and I think that is the question you are really asking. That is what changed my, uh, my outlook. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, but uh, if I may add, the policeman thing, uh, uh, 15 years or 11 years, is uh, not uh, a major part of my life or a major part of my outlook. But I have a 
one called routine, which is very tough. And the first book, when uh, when Ilal asked me, I was in the police and in Barabanki. I had just returned from the hill, and it was tough. So uh, a lot. Of, uh, I start with a riot. And that is the name which critics gave me. Oh, he writes about police, he writes about violence. Uh, I think that's unfair. And uh, the academia has article after article. I, I, I'm a member of this academia thing uh, on, on my violence and on my police. Uh, Subhiman Mandal has a question. Uh, the question says that what should be the role of the poet in the current scenario where we have evils like you know casteism and so many political problems how can the poet help make a change in the current scenario i'll answer that the poet should not be totally a politician but he must stand up. sorry he must stand up against casteism he must stand up against police atrocities. I have written an article in the Tribune about this, these wretched encounters. Even if the man had killed eight policemen, the way they shot him this week, it's a, uh, it's a shame. I, I think it's a disgrace. So write about atrocities, uh, what happened in Delhi. I mean, the riots in uh, Jamia. Uh, the police entering the library and uh, those masked 50 goons coming into JNU, write about it. But that should not be your major output. Your finer feelings, what you write about nature, life, uh, relationships, other things, that must go on. It, your poetry must not be totally clouded by politics. We have enough of politics in the country as it is. That's a beautiful takeaway. Poetry must not be clouded entirely with politics is a beautiful takeaway for all of us uh, here. Uh, we have another question. Uh, I think uh, you have already answered it in this particular question. Uh, where the question asks whether there is a possibility of combining romanticism with brute reality. Yes, I hope. And reality I have, and romanticism. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm. I've done. I've tried to do that myself. But uh, I mean, reality is now. Uh, there are so many shades, so many levels of reality. Whether it's uh, reality has become very, uh, very vast and very layered, you know, very layered. So uh, write about reality and romanticism not, should, should not be just dreaming and uh, getting away with daydreams. Uh, you have to be anchored in a way to what is happening around you and what is stretching ahead of you, which is the future, which is the future. I mean, today we are buried in under this coronavirus, but uh, I'm sure, and I hope, I'll, I'll be right, that we'll come back to the old normal as well. But the old normal uh, not uh, knocking out the environment. I mean, this has done a lot of good to the environment, if I miss it. It is done badly. Uh, uh, for the humans, it is bad. But for the environment and even for animal life, bird life, uh, it has been good in a way. Yes, sir. And I think... Uh We come to uh, we come on the story love across the salt desert. So we were just talking about this a little while ago, and uh, so this participant wants to ask what inspired you to write the story. Uh, was it a true story? And if you could reflect on you know the process of writing, I have 
I have never written a true story, possibly one. Otherwise, uh, in the police, you get so many cases, then you can you you can turn each one into a short story. All the stories that I have written, and I am coming out with a book called Long Stories uh, from the crevices of the past. By the end of the year, it will be published. Uh, it it's all imagination. I mean, art has to be a product of your imagination. Even if you are a painter, it's your it's your imagination which takes you where it is. Uh, and uh, if you are writing true stories, then it then it is a reportage. Then it is a reportage. Yes, sir. And uh, I think we want to finally close uh, by uh, people who want you to read one of your love poems at least. So you did not read a single love poem today. Uh, if you could read one of your love poems, uh, and that would be a befitting close to this uh, oh, wonderful boy. session that yeah, we have today. Uh, it's uh, okay. It's a bit risky, but uh, doesn't matter. Uh, there are lots Two of risks virtually. There are five or six or seven love poems. Uh, the Night of the Jackals. I mean. I, I I hope the library has the uh, the collected poems. Then it's I find it's pretty cheap. Yes, it's we have it in the library, and we have our personal copies also. Okay, I'll read the first poem from the Night of the Jackals. It is just the telephone between us, grey, impersonal. The children are sleeping. She says, "Come." She had to think of me now with the elements in full cry and the smell uh, and the air smelling of lightning burns like a scorched belt. I park my car 11 blocks away. People scurry off the roads as the sky crackles. I press the buzzer hard and tap at the glass door along with the thunder. Tonight she'll be waiting, arched fully backwards, vibrant as new leaf. She sits there, white cardigan, dark slacks, laughing as she knits away, caressing the rug with her bare feet. The blankets over her children, heavy with their regular breathing. It'll go well with her if I kiss them on their foreheads. Suddenly, she is in my arms, swarming. Her nipples and the grass outside harden together, tense with coming thunder. Kissing her on the neck, I nibble the words as they slur across her skin. Did the thunder frighten you? Yes, with both the kids asleep, it was eerie, terrifying. And if the children had been awake, she may not have thought of me for another three months. That's it. Beautiful. And uh, with this... But uh, we have yet another question. Uh, yes. No, that's not a question. It is it is a thank you note to you from one of our students. Uh, I'll read out the note. She says, this is Ekta Dogra, one of our students, who says, you were first to introduce me to the magic of poetry in middle school. And it's very nostalgic and an honor to have met you here on screen and have had the pleasure of listening to you. So, uh, yes, it's a dream come true for all of us, you know, from uh, the pages of the book when we move towards, uh, you know, listening uh, to the poet actually and uh, seeing him virtually on screen. Uh, it, it's a blessing and it's, uh, it's a lifetime uh, experience for all of us. So uh, I think uh, we come to the end of this uh, very beautiful and uh, very special session that we have had today. And I would like to invite uh, our faculty, uh, member, our colleague, uh, Dr. Neha Tiwari, to, to formally deliver the vote of thanks for today. Neha, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Someone asked me, how can you become an escapist? You don't have to be an escapist. You must face reality and face the air around you. We are facing the coronavirus. Come on. So we are not escaping. We are not escapists. Sorry. 
Go ahead. Go yes, ahead. we are. You certainly are <laughs> not an escapist. You certainly are not an escapist. Your Tribune articles every week remind us of that. Uh, so uh, over to Neha, ma'am. Neha, ma'am. Professor yeah, Ibrahim and um, uh, um, Roy, <laughs> thank you very much for this morning. I'm grateful. Many thanks. We are grateful, thank sir. Neha, ma'am, please. And uh, yeah. Uh, actually, sir, it was uh, beyond our imagination that one day uh, we will be able to listen to you personally. Uh, Sorry. Uh, Gee, sir, the, the, my, yes. uh, am, am I audible? Yes, yeah. yes, you are audible, ma'am. Okay. Uh, sir, I am Dr. Neha Tewari. I am also part of the uh, uh, Department of uh, English and Karim City College. And uh, uh, yes. yeah, I was just mentioning, sir, that this was beyond our imagination that we are going to listen to you personally, uh, maybe through virtual window. Uh, uh, we just used to uh, think that only through text uh, we will be able to uh, uh, get to you or uh, know you. Uh, but it has been a, a privilege that uh, today you are here in this uh, session. And uh, I would like to uh, mention uh, one letter. Uh, which has been written by uh, the Japanese uh, director, Akira Kurosawa, uh, to Mr. Bergman, who is the Swedish uh, film director. And he has written in this uh, letter uh, that I believe that uh, the, uh, when one uh, uh, reaches to uh, 80s, when a man reaches to its 80s, actually uh, uh, he reaches to uh, second babyhood. And because it's a babyhood, man becomes very pure and without any restrictions. So whatever an artist or writer produces, when he is in his 80s, is the best, the purest, uh, the magnificent. So uh, it is our wish that you continue producing your purest uh, text, purest poetry, purest words, and you keep on writing as you are writing, uh, not just on landscape, not just on society, but politics. Everything which uh, uh, touches you uh, will, of course, going to touch us as well. So uh, it is just our good wishes uh, that you uh, keep on uh, writing, sir in this uh, age of uh, second babyhood, as uh, Akira Kurosawa mentions. Uh, I have, uh, been, as the uh, Department of uh, English, we are very uh, grateful that you have accepted uh, our invitation and become the part of uh, this uh, uh, cyber conversation, uh, this virtual conversation. I would also like to thank uh, all the faculty members and students who have joined us from the uh, various corners of the country uh, we are also thankful to the uh, Basudhara who has become uh, your cyber friend and uh, uh, virtually we are able to uh, uh, interact with you in this uh, particular session. Uh, thank you so much everyone who has been a part of this journey today. Thank you very much for the comments. Many thanks, madam. Thank you, sir. So with this, we come to an end of our session. And uh, okay. we hope that we wish you, from all of us, we wish you all the best. And we hope that you have a very happy, creative yeah. period. We wish you all the uh, best in my fiction. Yes, sir. Uh, we hope that you have a happy December with uh, all your I, books coming up. I, ab I abandoned my last novel a year and a half back. It was not, I was not doing well. But I'll go back to it someday. But you must know. Wonderful. When, we hope and wish. Writer must know when he or she is writing badly. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. Bye. Thank you I, so much, sir. Once I, again. Bye. 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 Bye, sir. Bye, bye, sir. Bye.